is Professor Drew Karata, and we are moving on with part two of our discussions. The other part we have talked about uh, elements and dynamics to do with the energy, and we talked about, we mentioned heat and work as the basic elements and surroundings and systems, and we did a few calculations here and there. This portion here we want to focus on heat, which is another basic element in, in thermodynamics. Now, when you talk of heat, you will always think in terms of temperature change. You are heating up a system. The only evidence you have that it's being heated up is that you have a temperature change. If you have a nice calorimeter, that means you have ice somewhere and you are applying heat, you are going to see the ice melt. That is kind of uh, a visual score in terms of uh, telling whether there is heat produced. And that has been the standard method which people have always used to characterize or observe heat in terms of, uh, of uh, sciences and engineering. Now, like we have already said, when you apply heat, there will be a change in temperature. If you apply a lot of heat, there will be a light change in temperature. If you apply small amounts of heat, there will be small amounts of change in temperature. What does that mean? It means that heat is directly proportional to temperature. In other words, as you apply more heat, the temperature increases. So in mathematics, we can say that heat, which we denoted as Q, that is the denotation for heat, for heat, you can say that heat, that is Q, is proportional to temperature, where T is temperature. So if we talk of two quantities being directly proportional, for example, if we say A is proportional to B, then in terms of mathematical notation, we can say A is equal to KB, where K is a proportionality constant. Proportionality constant. So in the same, same way, using this mathematical form for the relationship between heat and temperature, we can say that Q A is proportional to temperature. And the proportionality constant here is what we call the heat capacity. It introduces the term heat capacity. So that's very, very important for us to note. What is the heat capacity? If you look at heat capacity, we simply rearrange this expression and it will give us a fail of what heat capacity is. That is, if we rearrange, you have C will be equal to Q over T. So it means that if the heat capacity C is large, then for the amount of heat which you sub apply, supply to the system, the change in temperature is not, is not very large. But if the heat capacity is small, then it means that when you apply heat to that particular system, the change in temperature is very large. So basically what we are saying is that small heat capacity means you are dividing with a large T, and large heat capacity means you are dividing with, a, with, a, with small T. That is the important, that's heat capacity. Now, this quantity heat capacity, this quantity heat capacity is an extensive variable. Heat capacity, heat capacity is an extensive variable. An extensive variable. What does that mean? Extensive variable. That means it depends on the quantity, the amount of material. So that if you have a whole drum of water you are trying to heat and trying to monitor the heat capacity, definitely you have to apply a lot of heat to change its temperature significantly. So heat capacity is an extensive variable. It depends on quantities. But when we divide the heat capacity by the number of moles of that particular substance, that is, let us call the, let's denote the number of moles as N. So if we, if we divide the heat capacity by N, then we get the molar heat capacity. Molar heat capacity. Molar heat capacity. And this molar heat capacity is now not an extensive variable, but an intensive variable. Where CM is an intensive variable. It's an intensive variable. In other words, it doesn't depend on the quantity. Intensive variable. It doesn't depend on the quantity of substances. Now, heat capacity depends on the conditions under which you are doing that determination. You can measure your heat capacity under constant pressure. So if you measure heat capacity under constant pressure, it becomes 
the isobaric heat capacity, which is denoted as Cp. So if we determine heat capacity as a constant pressure, it becomes the isobaric heat capacity, which we denote as Cp, denoted as Cp. And we are going to see in the other lectures that this Cp is really what we call the internal energy, which we are going to derive as we work on the first law of thermodynamics, and you will see how it comes in. But basically, at this point, Cp is del u, del t, with pressure constant. It is, it is del h, del t, pressure constant, where h is the enthalpy, h is the enthalpy. And when we talk of del, when we talk of del, that d which is incomplete, that del is a partial derivative. We call it del. It's a partial derivative. And we are going to see what it is as we advance with these lectures. It's a partial derivative. That means during change of one of the variables, as you change one of the variables, you keep one or more variables constant as you change that particular variable. So it's referred to as a partial derivative. It's a partial derivative, del. So that Cp is del H, del T, P constant. The, subs, the, the variable which is kept constant is written as a suffix outside the bracket. That P there means pressure is constant. Similarly, if we measure heat capacity and the constant volume, it becomes the isochoric heat capacity. Once there is a chorus, heat capacity. That means heat capacity and a constant volume. A chorus heat capacity. Chorus heat capacity, and that is denoted as Cv. Again, that Cv is given as del u del t with volume constant. Notice again, the volume which is which is the variable kept constant is written outside the bracket and. The del means that as u changes with respect to t, when v is kept constant. So we read this quantity as del u del t v constant. That means this is a partial derivative where u changes with temperature, but the volume is kept constant. And that gives us the isochoric heat capacity. That's the heat capacity and a constant volume. And we are going to see that when we are dealing with these particular quantities, we are going to see that this heat capacity is related to expressions involving ideal gases, that is Cp for an ideal gas, for an ideal gas. And remember what is an ideal gas? An ideal gas is a gas which obeys the equation of state Pv is equal to N R T. That is for an ideal gas, when you measure the pressure, the volume, and you measure the temperature, then you'll find that they're related in the manner pressure times volume will give you N, which is the number of moles of that gas, R is the gas constant, which we have seen in lecture one, and T is the temperature. So for ideal gases in general, Cp, the isobaric heat capacity, plus Cv is equal to N R T. This is true for ideal gases. Very important to note that for ideal gases. And so in the next lecture, we are going to look at the first law of thermodynamics, and we are going to come up with expressions where later on we are going to see how we can relate these quantities, that is the quantities involving internal energy, which we have already mentioned, and enthalpy. Internal energy is the U, which we are seeing here. U there is the internal energy. Energy, just to recap, H is the enthalpy, and these quantities are very important in thermodynamics. That's why you will see most of your reactions are given in terms of the change in U, that's delta U, or the change in H, that's delta H. So, as we move on in subsequent lectures, you're going to see what's the significance of these quantities delta U, delta H, and why are they used at different under different conditions and under different uh, types of reactions. And we'll stop at that. We'll look at lecture three where we move it on to first law of thermodynamics.